Hello all, this is John Linville. This weekend at the 23rd annual last Chicago Cocoa Fest, I gave a talk on the NTSC 8-bit artifact color mode on the, that is available on the Cocoa 3. This will be uh, a screencast to try to replicate that event for those who were unable or unwilling to attend. So, I hope you enjoy. Okay, let's talk about the NTSC 8-bit color mode that is available on the Color Computer 3. Again, this talk was first given at the 23rd Annual Last Chicago Cocoa Fest on the 26th of April in 2014. Who am I? Well, I'm John Linville. I'm the author of Farfall. I've been a member of the Color Computer, color computer Community for quite some time. And, uh, well, Google me. So what are we talking about? Is this is about an NTSC only 8-bit color mode that's available on the Color Computer 3. Uh, again, it only works on the uh, NTSC video outputs and uh, it's 8 bits are used to specify a color. Some of the colors seem to be duplicates so it's not really 256 colors but uh, I'm counting closer to 225. But anyway, 8 bits. This is not a page flipping mode. I'm not changing the palette during the screen display. Um, I do some dithering in my own color, uh, my own picture conversions, but the dithering is not what is causing the colors. Uh, those, the, the colors are real, they're inherent in the system, in the signal sent on the composite video output. This mode is not CPU intensive. Um, it doesn't work for RGB outputs and um, do the way the Color Computer 3 was built for PAL and other video modes or video regions. Um, it won't work with them. It wouldn't work with them anyway because of the details of the video signals. This is not just for some TVs. This works equally well on um, LCD TVs and uh, CRT TVs and should work on basically any TV that accepts NTSC signals. If it doesn't, uh, I'm pretty sure your TV is broken. Uh, it's not hard to use. This is not some trick to this programming. It's just a matter of setting out the right video mode and writing bytes where you want pixels. It's really not a big deal to use at all. So, how do we get here? Uh, apparently this mode was known quite some time ago. It's uh, If you read the manual for the GraphExpress uh, authoring system from 1991, uh, it describes uh, 256 color programs uh, in a very nonchalant way as if everybody was doing it. Um, and the, if you know about this mode and how it's working, their description seems pretty obvious to be talking about this mode. So. This was known in the past. I'm not sure why it wasn't more widely known or more widely used, but you know, there it is. Um, so uh, here's a URL for the curious among us uh, to a mailing list post. But uh, a few years ago, uh, a guy who calls himself Potato Head on the Atari Age website um, became aware of this mode through some of his other hacking projects. Um, and they involved uh, Brian Palmer, who goes by the name of Breeza, uh, Jason Law, uh, Robert Galt, uh, Joel Yui got involved. There's probably some others. Um, feel free to trace uh, through this URL to wherever it leads you and see what you can find out about it. Um, there's also a Potato Head's blog uh, available at that URL called Color Computer 3 Artifact Art. Where he talks a bit more about the topic. Um, on Coco3.com, uh, there's some postings around February 2009, the title 256 Color Mode, Composite Mode Artifacting. This is when I became aware of the mode. Um, I discussed some of it, particularly with Jason Law, who at that time sent me some palette files that I was able to use to do some video conversions. Um, there's a big brouhaha that eventually came about that. Um, 
Jason seems to be trying to get up past it. I'm ready to be past it myself. So let's just leave that at that. Um, okay, there's also this, uh, the myth of the color, Coco 3 256 color mode smiley face uh, thing. It was posted to the Coco mailing list. It's also available uh, on the TandyCoco.com forum site uh, dating from April of 2013. So please do go there and check it out yourself. So let's talk about NTSC signals. So NTSC was the analog television system for most of the Americas, certainly in the United States and Canada, uh, I think Mexico and large amounts of, of South America, um, notably not Brazil. Um, anyway, it was a uh, it was a video mode that was commonly used, like I say, especially in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, they standardized a black and white signal f in 1941. Um, color signal came about in 1956. Uh, they were able to do this in a way where the color signal was still compatible with the black and white receivers. So even when uh, Andy Griffith changed the color, you could still watch uh, uh, the Andy Griffith show on your old black and white TV. Um, this is because the color signal is really a colored version of the black and white signal. It's pretty ingenious, really. Um, please note that when I'm referring to composite video uh, or any reference to composite video, it's just uh, NTSC video without the RF part of the signal. So your composite video out on the Coco 3 is really uh, is an NTSC output just like the RF out is. And again, that's for the North American models. Okay, so uh, NTSC uses what's called a YIQ color space. Um, Y represents luminance, or how light that part of the uh, display is, while I and Q represent chrominance, or you know what color that part of the display is. Um, YIQ triplets are computed from RGB triplets. Um, the black and white televisions only use the Y component of that, which is why they were able to be compatible with uh, the color signals. So, how do you put three signals onto one wire? Well, you use an instantaneous voltage to encode the Y part of the signal. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's a lot like uh, how AM radio is encoded. Um, so, you use the I part of the color to modulate a sine wave and add that to the existing Y signal. And then use the Q part of the color to modulate a cosine wave and add that to the existing Y plus I signal. Uh, so the resulting signal has all three color components. Uh, the information is buried inside that signal. So, okay, so I've stolen this image from the URL shown below, and I'm shamelessly using it and asking for forgiveness later, I suppose. Anyway, it's a really good set of graphs um, that's used to illustrate the encoding. So imagine the Y signal uh, shown to the left. Uh, that's where you start from. Now, so... The, on the top right, you have uh, a sine wave, and let's say you're trying to encode the I signal shown at the bottom left, which of course is going up and to the right. So you multiply that times the sine wave, and you get that um, you know, almost looks like the trumpet shape graph uh, in the bottom right corner. So when you add those, uh, the top left and the bottom right from the last page together, you get something that looks like the purple signal here. And so then if you were to average that out, you'd get the red line, which, you know, like is reminiscent of the Y signal before. So I'm sorry about skipping ahead there. So, so how do you add the third component? So imagine you have this Q signal from the top left corner and the uh, cosine uh, graph is shown on the bottom left. So you multiply those together, you end up with something that looks like the top right corner. And then add that into the existing signal and you get something that looks like the purple part of the bottom right corner. And again, if you were to average all that out, you still end up with something that looks like that original Y signal. So, so anyway, now that we've seen how the color is encoded, how do you get it out at the other end? Uh, the timing portions of the NTSC signal include what's called color burst info, which is really just a, 
a sine wave that's used to synchronize clocks so that you can discriminate uh, the phase of the sinusoidal uh, pieces of the signal. So you pass in the signal uh, through a low pass filter and you can recover the Y component. That's essentially the average that was shown in those previous graphs. Um, y and Q are recoverable by multiplying either sine or cosine and then filtering. Um, this is sort of my, the whole point of this discussion is that this is signal processing. Um, some of the other attempts to, uh, to document this mode or to describe this mode have seemed to be falling back on trying to interpret the individual sections of the signal as if they're discrete digital components. and and even though they, you get some usable results from that, I think it's really the wrong approach. And I think it's uh, uh, a lot less flexible than the, getting a nice mathematical description here, which then could more easily be incorporated into an emulator that can handle whatever uh, combination of inputs uh, to the uh, GIMI hardware uh, that someone might conceive of, rather than being locked into a specific a priori knowledge of what uh, palette values are being assigned. So, here's another important point that uh, for understanding the, the fact how you can generate artifact colors. So the color brush frequency is at a rate which only allows for 160 color changes or color clocks in a given line. Um, so, well, let's just keep, hold that for a little thought for later. Um, this graph is used to show some of the demodulation and uh, so again if you multiply out uh, by the, uh, uh, I'm not sure which now is sine or cosine, I have to look at the code, but you can see by multiplying this, the signal uh, out and then averaging you get something that looks like uh, on the left your original I signal and on the right something that looks like your original Q signal. So. Again, go to the URL there, that Code in Life URL, uh, and uh, read all that. And hopefully uh, that will answer any questions that you have that I may have provoked with <laughs> my fine oratory. Um, anyway, so let's talk about some pa facts about the hardware. So, again, there's only room for 160 color transitions in an NTSC line signal. So... Any mode that attempts to show more than 160 horizontal pixels in a line is going to produce uh, artifact colors. Um, specifics regarding palette size and the, the colors generated um, will vary based on uh, the range and frequency of those hardware transitions per line. Um, the frequency depends on the horizontal resolution setting divided by 160 uh, or 128 in, in the case of the Coco 3 because the, it's really 160 but the, uh, the Coco 3's video modes uh, uh, that have less, well that, that are multiples of 128, um, uh, they're really clocked, they're really uh, positioned on this, the line uh, so that they're using just 128 of the available 160 clock phases. Um, so, you know, if you have a 256 color mode or 256 horizontal uh, pixel mode, um, you're only you're going to get 128 uh, color clocks. But if you had a 320 horizontal pixel mode, you'll get a 160 color clocks to, to work with. Does that make sense? Well, let's hope. Uh, so the transition range is going to depend on uh, the color mode setting, um, basically how many colors, uh, how many uh, palette registers are in use and what the values are in those registers. Okay, something interesting about the Coco 3 palette registers is, is, as I put it here, they're close to the physical outputs. And what I mean by that is there's not a lot of hardware in between the register values and what actually goes out on the wire. So um, that's, for example, one reason why you need different values for for RGB monitors versus uh, composite or NTSC monitors. Um, it was just because they didn't they didn't put in any hardware that would translate uh, a single value, say an RGB value, out to composite video colors. Because I guess that would have cost them an extra ten cents or whatever the numbers are. <laughs> so, um, so they're like I said, the outputs are. are 
physically close to the uh, the signals that go out to the t to the monitor. Um, for NTSC, uh, uh, the, the pallet registers uh, have uh, a section of bits marked S and a section of bits marked A. The S bits drive the Y part of the output and the A bits. Uh, uh, S probably is supposed to stand for saturation and uh, A is probably supposed to stand for angle, uh, as in phase angle for the color. But the, the A bits drive uh, uh, driver, uh, spelling error. Anyway, they drive the I and Q signals. Um, an A value of all zeros is intended to indicate a grayscale signal, so black, gray, white, that sort of thing. Um, that's the pallet register format for those that aren't familiar with it. I just stuck it here because I didn't have a better slide for it. Okay, so there are several choices that can be made that will affect the available pallet. Um, the number of pallet registers in use uh, it could be 2, 4, or even 16. Um, the S values for the pallet registers to use. And there's only two bits there, and so um, if you have an A setting of all zeros, then it doesn't really make sense to use more than four pallet registers, um, for example. Uh, the A values are in use as well, but the, uh, the effect of the non-zero A values is not well understood. It, Changing the values, the A values to something other than zero will change the colors displayed, but I personally don't have a good model for how that happens, so that's future work still to be done. As far as I know, most of the work with this mode has been done with settings that use four pallet registers and four pallet selections within an NTSC color clock. So that would be, you know, a 640 or 512 pixel mode. Uh, in terms of what the, the gimme thinks it's doing at least. Um, again, no matter how many pixels the gimme thinks it's doing, you're only getting 160 or, or 128 color selections uh, on a given line. So uh, that makes the term pixel a little bit loaded because, you know, what do you mean by pixel? Are you talking about what the gimme's doing? Are you talking about what the color selection is or whatever? Uh, unfortunately, it's just hard to talk about graphics without talking about pixels unless uh, <laughs> unless someone has a better nomenclature for me we'll just try to muddle through with that okay so how does this work so you configure the hardware to generate signal transitions at a frequency that's faster than the NTSC clock, color clock rate so that means that the gimme needs to think that it's doing you know 256 or 320 or 640 or, or more pixels uh, uh, even you know again even though the the monitor at the other end is only going to read 160 color values or color transitions or color clocks um, each transition that the gimme does is going to select a new palette register that palette registers S and A values determines what's actually sent out on the wire for that portion of the color clock now you can have multiple transitions occurring during a single color clock. The NTSC decoder at the video monitor doesn't really know what you're doing. He just sees all those transitions and assumes that you mean them as uh, encoded I and Q values. So he decodes them as such and generates color to the best of his ability. So Let's prove that this is how it works. So I've built a model that predicts the actual palette colors. Um, I'm trying to, using that, at least what I think is happening, I simulate the signals generated by the Coco 3 in these modes, um, and then feed that into a simulation of what I think the NTSC receiver will generate in response. And then I walk through every, of the, every combination of those signals in order to map out the palette uh, to what uh, predict the RGB equivalents would be uh, for that uh, that color value in the vi video buffer. So how do we model all this? For right now, I'm going to have to ignore the, the non-zero A values. Like I said, I don't really understand what they do. I have some ideas, but uh, not really prepared to elucidate any of it right now. So. 
Uh, so we're going to ignore those and calculate an output value that's proportional to the S value for a given pallet register. And then feed that as a stream of values to our decoder to predict RGB values. So at the decoder, we're going to take every segment of a given color clock. So if, for example, this the, the pallet we're using now, there are going to be four segments in a given color clock time. Um, we'll, get, we'll calculate the Y value based on the uh, value of the bits corresponding to that segment. So the, basically the S values for that selected register will, will just go straight to the Y value for that part of the segment. Y will be that Y, uh, I will be that Y value multiplied by an integration of a cosine wave during that first period uh, of the segment. Uh, and then Q uh, is an integration of the sine wave also for that period of the segment. So we'll take the uh, average Y, I, and Q values uh, from each segment. So there's four, there'll be four partial Y, I, and Q values for a color clock. And we'll, within each of those variables, we'll average them out to get a Y, I, Q average for that color clock. And then that gets converted back to RGB. So, all right, well, let's see what, how we've done so far then. Okay, so on the left is a palette uh, that I calculated based on my model. Uh, so there's 256 positions there and the RGB values um, that I've predicted based on my YIQ math and uh, gamma correction and, you know, whatever else. <laughs> but anyway, that's what, I'm, that's what I predict on the left. On the right is a picture taken with my... Uh, cell phone camera of an LCD screen displaying all those possible values. So they're not exactly the same. Um, part of it could be the crappy cell phone camera and my bad photography skills or whatever. But even then, you know, they're not exactly the same even in person, but I think it's pretty close. I hope you agree. So there are a number of uncertainties that still exist, and of course that's going to lead to some imperfect results. Um, probably could use better, more specific information about how S values are reflected in the output. So, for example, I, I give them a little bit of an offset and then I scale them a certain amount. It could be that I that the scale that I'm applied you know, that I'm applying could be well, it, it might be scaled non-linear non-linearly. It might be scaled with different boundaries. The offset might be wrong. Um, you know, there could be any number of variations in there. Just what probably needs to happen is uh, need to get a, a, a logic analyzer on the uh, actual pins of the gimme to test some of this stuff out, but I hadn't got there. Um, I don't have any information about how the A values are reflected in the output. Um, like I said, I have a couple of thoughts on how it might be, but I really haven't modeled it out yet. Um, I think that would be very nice to have if you wanted to build upon this to be able to generate, you know, a generic, or yeah, to generate a palette based on any combination of uh, palette register settings or other give me register settings. <laughs> so um, I don't have the specifics for signal generation either. So. For example, part of the color calculations involve uh, uh, a phase offset value for the sinusoidal functions. Now, I have a number that I've picked that is part theoretical and and part empirical, and uh, you know the empirical part, well, even the theoretical part could be wrong. The empirical part could be off by half a degree or a whole degree or, or whatever. So, you know that would introduce a certain amount of error. Um, one thing that isn't entirely cure, uh, clear is um, what influence the preceding color clock signal ought to have on the color on the current color clock. Uh, you can see on some displays, you can see particularly at the at the edges, or this term is often called fringing, where when two colors sort of butt up together, you'll see a, a little bit of a difference or overlap between them. I'm not convinced that that is even an entire color clock's worth of difference, or or even even close to it. But um, it might be worth trying to figure that out. So the the effect there is you might get a slightly different set of colors, say if you displayed the palette in a different order. 
Um, I'm not convinced that it's a, a significant enough to worry about, but maybe it is, or for if you're a purist, it probably is. Um, anyway, it's future work for someone to do. And then, of course, this is what uh, we might call the unknown unknowns. Uh, there's bound to be something that I don't fully understand and uh, haven't accounted for, and so therefore, if it's not a source of error, it's only because of luck. So, anyway, so let's look at some. Uh, oh, let's see. So, yeah, all I have so far is a guess and check uh, methodology. Uh, so I think about how it might work, uh, try some code, and see what I get. <laughs> I think it's worked out pretty well so far, but. I'm sure there could be better methods if you really want to know exactly what's happening. So feel free to jump in. So let's look at some pictures. Um, on the left is the original picture. Uh, it's my, my son uh, from a few years back. And on the right uh, is, again, it's a cell phone picture of an LCD screen. Um, again, and it is a dithered picture. The colors are not from the dithering, but the, the, it is dithered. Um, you know, again, it's far from perfect, but I think it's pretty good. And, of course, the conversion is based on my predicted palette. So if the prediction was off, the, the conversion would be off. Uh, and so the, the prediction has to be fairly close to reality to get uh, good results. Um, here's a picture of me from a couple of years back. Uh, this is a picture I took of uh, the famous Steve Bjork. Um, looking a little blurry on the right, but still fairly faithful to the colors, I think. Um, and then again, another picture of me at Halloween at our house a couple of years ago. So, and again, uh, differences between LCD and CRT. Uh, the picture on the left is the same as the predicted uh, or the calculated palette from a few slides back. Uh, the picture on the right is the same image displayed on the uh, Sony 27-inch CRT from 96 or so. <laughs> anyway, you know, no, they're not exactly the same, um, but they're pretty close. Uh, so it's not an LCD thing or a CRT thing. It, it, it's a signal thing. And if they're trying to interpret the same signals, you should get the same results, give or take. And keep in mind that NTSC uh, has often been derided as uh, an acronym for never the same color. So <laughs> it may be impossible to get the same results even between two monitors. All right, so anyway, uh, in conclusion, this 8-bit uh, color mode on the Coco 3 is uh, its real, uh, it's usable. Uh, there's really no reason not to use it if uh, you want to produce something uh, for the Coco 3. Um, now on the, my European and uh, some South American uh, uh, friends will probably not like this, but I think NTSC output is probably fine for a majority of Coco 3 users. I could be uh, wrong, but uh, it certainly seems like most of the activity around the Coco 3 is uh, related to North America, and uh, even the ones who are outside of North America, uh, if they don't already have NTSC-capable equipment, uh, they certainly could should, could get it. So if you want to write, uh, if you're dying to write a 256 or at least 225 or otherwise 8-bit color game, for the Coco 3, I think this is probably your own, only option, uh, at least uh, in in uh, in reality. Let's put it that way. Um, there's no special coding tricks required to use this mode. You just set it up, and then you just write 8-bit values to the video buffer, and the colors will kind of pop out. It's not difficult at all. Uh, and the CPU doesn't really have to do anything more for this video mode than it does any other video mode. Um, it does require um, you know, more memory, you know, it's 8 bits instead of 4 bits to describe a given pixel, so um, for the effective resolution, it's twice as much memory, but other than that, the CPU doesn't have to do anything other than move those bits around. Um, if you look at the picture conversions, I think the image quality is good, given the contemporary standards, uh, compare it to a, a Commodore 64 or, or you know, an Atari 8-bit, um, you know, I'm sure you can find examples of the Amiga looking much better, but, you know, uh, 
and PCs from the day from from 1986. Maybe not so much. So it's a good looking mode. It should be used. Um, I think having a mathematical model for determining the, the palettes that result from the gimme settings is is key if you want to add emulator support. Uh, if you otherwise, you have to assume. Um, that a certain a uh, certain palette is going to be used, and if somebody uses a different palette, a different set of register settings, even the same settings but in a different order for the palette registers, um, it's just not going to work. So we need something like this where we can account for the settings, run the function through, and and uh, just go on from there. And of course, we need more info about the hardware for a complete understanding. Uh, that especially includes the the A bits in the pallet registers, and uh, some of the other things that I mentioned before in the sources of error slide. So, uh, this was my question slide. Uh, that's uh, since uh, this is a screencast, you guys can't ask any questions. Uh, you can feel free to contact me. Um, I do have a, ga a Git tree available with uh, the palette calculator and my image conversion tools uh, so anyone who wants to take a whack at this there is some code in there that runs on the Coco 3 um, it's it's uh, pretty specific to my development environment and probably won't load it on under uh, anything other than my environment <laughs> but uh, there is a set of gimme set uh, register values in there that uh, might be illustrative uh, if you want to write your own code so uh, some links for the curious uh, this, uh, a link to the PDF with the NTSC signal spec uh, again that uh, composite video decoding theory and practice link that I stole those nice graphs from uh, earlier in the talk uh, and then, of course, a link to a, a, a sort of a similar project uh, done by an NES hobbyist who's trying to get uh, more accurate pallet settings uh, for an NES emulator, I believe. Anyway, that's pretty much it. The end of the presentation. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks.